this isn't a show. This this is it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is not a study. It's <laughs> yeah, not yeah, a yeah. research plan. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. This is it. This is real. What happened? The first thing they gave me was broth. Now oh, I don't know broth. if you know broth comes in uh, in. Uh, it comes in chicken and beef, but it doesn't make yeah. any difference because they both taste the same. They both taste oh, yeah, like yeah, broth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> they didn't yeah. give me a good chance of surviving this thing. I, I was the percentages were against sure. me, but anyway. I won uh, the person that was uh, uh, most likely to go overtime and be pushed off stage. <laughs> <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> You've Absolutely. been dodging us for a couple months. Well, I've, been, I've been in and out. I've yeah. been dodging. I've been, been dodging life. I'm yeah. lucky to. I'm lucky to be here. I'm we're we're tell glad you. we're here. Yes, like, we you know, are. Like, uh... Genuinely, very, very excited <laughs> yeah. that you're here. Well, I'm glad to be alive. Let me yeah. just put it was that it, way. Was it scary? Like, like, a little, little touch and go you know, there. I, would, I was here. You know, you know, a couple of months ago. And boy, you've changed this place. You really oh, got you, it decked out. I you don't it. even understand. This man has torn apart this iteration and reiterated it at least a dozen times in the last two tinker, months. You know, he tinkers like, like you wouldn't believe. Looks Just good. let me noodle. Looks good. Thank you. I really it looks great, it. right? Like yeah, it's it interesting. Great. Do you yeah. like all the artwork? Yeah, yeah. It looks the great. idea is is that at some point in time there will be something to look at at every surface that you look at. Isn't that something? Yeah? You like it? I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've missed you, Jim. Well. We're glad to have you here. Good. Welcome to Manly Girly Podcast. Thank you. The podcast about you. Okay. (laughs) Sorry. We're excited to see you last night. I was glad. Back in the game after a couple months. Well, see, I didn't do anything in uh, November and December. See, I went in the hospital in November. Yeah. And, what happened? Uh, Were you okay? Do you mind if we ask? Well, something? what happened is um, it was really strange. I, I've I've been feeling really good, mm-hmm. uh, and I've been doing uh, stand up for about a, a little bit, about a year and a half. You've and been, then all been of a sudden, s- then all of a sudden, I uh, in in November I couldn't swallow, mm. <gasps> and so I went uh, three days without being able to swallow water or food. <gasps> And so they rushed me to the hospital, and of course they had to feed me through my veins and everything. And but they couldn't, they they couldn't get me to swallow. Yeah. And then uh, while I was in there, because of the difficulty I had, I had a heart attack, and so I had the heart attack. So then the stress on your they heart. They focused on my heart, and it took them a couple of days to get that f- sort of leveled out. And then they went back and tried to get me to swallow, so they moved me to a different hospital because they needed other machinery or they needed other yeah. testing, whatever Things it was. Things that they, they had available, a, they yeah. They went to a bigger hospital. They rushed me over there, and then finally they got me where I could uh, uh, swallow. I, I, I get <laughs> tickled. You're always looking for uh, yeah. for material. <laughs> of course, you get in a the hospital, there's plenty of material you can use in comedy <laughs> But one of the things that happened is once I got to swallow, uh, then because uh, I, I, I was they, they didn't give me a good chance of surviving this thing. I, I was the percentages were against me. But anyway, started to survive. But then then I get on hospital food, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and what happened? The first thing they gave me was broth. Now oh, I don't know broth. if you know broth comes in uh, in. Uh, it comes in chicken and beef, but it doesn't make yeah. any difference because they both taste the same. They both taste oh, yeah, like yeah, broth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. You didn't make it like mom used to make. I'll make you some broth and oh, it'll you taste know good. How to make yeah, broth. I'll, I'll, I'll make you, you oh, some okay. bone broth that'll cure whatever <laughs> cure else whatever. you. Well, that's, yeah. what they, that's what they tried to they do. They tried to do, but me. they didn't make it like mom used to make. Uh, I know how to make it you'd like okay, mom made. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I'll lots of you. garlic. I'll cure you up real good. I'll tell you, they. But boy, they took care of me. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, that they broth were good. was good for you. They were good. Yeah. 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 I'm sure, you know, like your lady's very happy, you know, isn't that? She gets know, to keep you for a few. Yeah. Yeah. Do you make your lady laugh? I try to. Does she <laughs> laugh at your jokes? Do you test them out on her? <laughs> yeah, a little. <laughs> a little? Yeah. 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 No, and, and, and uh, you know, oh, we're so glad that, you know, to have you, to feel here that you're feeling better. Genuinely, um, yeah. 
you know, I, I talk with Andy pretty uh, pretty often about that. You know, um, we all have, you know, I guess an optimism really and a, a perception, right? That everybody thinks that all the things that happen is going to happen to somebody else, right? And I tell Andy, I'm like, it's kind of like a spinning wheel, like, you know, like a wheel of prices, but at infinitum, you know, infinite wheels of all the things that can happen to you in your life, good or bad. And they have to land on somebody at some point. They're not all going to land on everyone at, at, at all the time. And, uh, you know, the journey is the destination. So I'm glad that you're still on the journey with us, my friend. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Um, the wheel has to stop on somebody. Yeah. <laughs> We're glad and, and, it's not you. <laughs> no, 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 And we really admire you. Like, uh, I, uh, I mentioned to Andy that I was like, I don't know how you didn't win in the, the 2022 rally uh, comedy awards. I voted for you. The first best newcomer. I was like, Jim Payne has this. The, uh, I don't know how they. Uh, I wasn't even aware that I was on the list because I was in the hospital when they were doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the. Um, uh, I actually found out I was on the list when uh, one of the comics had uh, emailed me and said he had voted for me. And uh, so I really wasn't on it. And I don't know how, how I don't know how they do it, but I really uh, like the people at Crafty. Mm -hmm. At what? Uh, they're they're very they're very good, Crafty. and I think that's where that all originates from is Crafty. That when they do that contest, I'm sure, guessing. Yeah. But I think that's right. Well, okay. what an honor to just be nominated. Well, it's, it should be good. I, I appreciate that. I mean, yeah. I think it was well la deserved. La well uh, deserved. Uh, now, last year I won. Uh, the person that was uh, uh, most likely to go overtime and be pushed off stage. <laughs> 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 so that was last year. Okay. <laughs> I hear it. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, I mean, you've got a story is, uh, to tell, and what, you don't like to be constrained. So what happened is uh, they saw there was a couple of times I'm new at it, see? And... Um, there are a couple of times that I've gone overtime, and uh, what uh, what happened is I was at Good Nights, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a uh, five minute set that I did, and so I get on stage, and that particular night it was three minutes. Okay. Now look, I'm brand new. Okay, and so I get up there and I go through the set, and. Um, I really don't understand the light and all this other stuff. I just do a set. Yeah, yeah, sure, you're not yeah. And so that. anyway, yeah. so at the end of uh, uh, three minutes, they, uh, uh, of course, give you the light. And then uh, what they do is um, I think uh, they applaud. Okay. And then that means you're supposed to get off. Well, I thought they were applauding for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. The judge, and so yeah. then... Yeah, it sounded great. Then what happened is um, uh, Jeremy Alder was the yeah. uh, host. And so he came on stage to take me off stage. And I thought he was coming on to be part of my act. <laughs> and so I just keep on going. Yes. And so he comes up. And so... They turned the lights out, okay? Oh, uh, damn. <laughs> and what happens is you can't see your hand. In, it is pitch. That dark? They pitch black. Good night is very and dark, so yeah. And so I just kept going. In other words, I had five minutes. I just kept going in <laughs> in the dark. I just kept. They didn't You're know what brilliant. to do. They, they what else are you going to fucking do? do? They didn't know what to do. And oh, then, my uh, goodness. And then finally what happened is... Uh, uh, he got a hold of me and he got up my ear and he said, look, we're supposed to get off now. So we got off and then uh, Matt White uh, came over and he he said to me, he was the one that encouraged me to get on and and he said, we forgot to tell you the rules. <laughs> so they told me the rules. So that was my experience well, of being that... uh, kicked off stage. You didn't know the rules of the game. I didn't know the rules. Didn't know the rules. What 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 would you say is something that you've learned like this year and a half doing comedy really? Where have you learned a lot from it? You're a natural in it. So you mentioned to me before, right? You you are comfortable speaking in front of a crowd, right? Oh yeah, I, I have. Uh, I was a. Uh, I taught 
at the University of Virginia and taught the largest course there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I was used to teaching several hundred people Being and, a character. and so that. And then I also uh, had a consulting firm and was a motivational speaker and went on tour as a motivational speaker. So I, I had, I knew something about that. Never done any stand up though. And then of course, when I retired, I wanted to try to do stand up and COVID hit. So everything was closed. And so I had a year to write. And so I took a year just to write sets. Now I didn't know what a set was. Mm -hmm. I just wrote segments. And then uh, the first one that opened up was Dirty, Dirty Bull. Oh, I and love so that. Was good the first one. one. And uh, the thing that, uh, that, that I've learned, what's very interesting to me, is not the comedy or the set, but the culture. And the culture has fascinated me. Let me tell you why. And this is what I think. Take it for what it's worth. Now you have to realize I was 15 years at the University of Virginia, 35 years at the University of Mississippi. So 50 years as a university professor. And you're around people that are formally educated and that they're doing research, they're doing writing, they're teaching, they're service. But what they're doing at universities, the two universities, they were just trying to break in. For instance, when I went to the University of Virginia, that was the first year they allowed women. Mm. Okay. And uh, so then, uh, so I was there when they started to have women. And then uh, shortly thereafter, about five, six years after that, then they started trying to integrate uh, with blacks, okay, with minorities. How did that go? And so, uh, so I went, went through that. So what, what happened is... Uh, uh, got up, caught up where they were trying to do with the flag and Dixie and all this other stuff. And so they, I thought they did a pretty good job at the University of Virginia. And then I turned right around after 15 years and go to Mississippi. Lo and behold, I go right into the same thing again. They've got Dixie, they've got the flag, they're trying to get rid of it. And uh, they're trying to integrate. So all this time for the 50 years, what I see is universities studying about life and about integration, trying to integrate, trying to hire women, trying to promote, trying to hire blacks, trying to hire minorities, trying to do this, trying to do that. And I did that for 50 years and I thought, well, that's what it's all about. I get into comedy. They're living it. Mm. They're not trying it. Yeah. They're doing it. Let me explain. You go into universities, you go into the union and you go to lunch or you go to dinner. Whites will be at one table, blacks at the other, Asians at the other. It's like Boston. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You go in to comedy, th there's no separation. They're all talking to one another. They're all there. So what they're doing is they're actually living what the other people are trying to to, to study and to live. replicate yeah, and, and just, make it's happen. Just, it's just so uh, gratifying. So <laughs> what I have learned is uh, the uh, the uniqueness of reality of integration, both in well, in terms of you could say race, religion, uh, sex, gender, whatever. It's just it's just it's so uh, breathtaking and so wonderful. Mm -hmm. So the thing that I've learned is the culture. And I've just found it to be marvelous. I found, and I found it to be different. And I found it to be cleansing. Yeah. It's, it's been interesting to me. So, that, so I would say that's, that's the thing that I've, I'm really taken out of it. Now, I've only been doing it a year and a half, so that's you're beautiful. talking to a novice. No, but yeah. I mean, I mean, I really appreciate your perspective and your um, honesty about, you know, what it brings to your life and how you were involved in it. And, you mm -hmm. know, it's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. It's different, you know, different perspectives are important.
Yeah, and I, and what I what I sometimes think with uh, comedy as an art form, right? It seems that it's hard to deliver something that's fake in a stand up set, right? Like they like I think sometimes you can you can embellish, make stuff up, right? But I think as opposed to let's say if you're writing a book or a short story where you can a little bit dissociate, depersonalize it a little bit, that it's um we were talking about this earlier that, you know, and when it comes to movies, nobody gives, you know, anybody that makes a movie, edgy movie shit to the director or the writer. But in comedy, it's it's almost there is no in between. It's like directly connected, like the artist coming out of the artist as you're seeing it. And sometimes you just think it's somebody talking, but you don't realize that there is a lot behind the scenes and a lot of and, and in my opinion, a lot of comics. One of the best things, one of one of the best things I think about, or one of, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, I think a good comics don't have a lot of ego. Like they don't have a lot of like, kind of like you're not. You you can either be the jester or the king. You can't be both, you know. And uh, I really like that you can joke around. People understand that, as you mentioned, right? That camaraderie, even though they'll shit on each other, it is good nature. If it makes any sense, right? It like, makes a lot of sense to me. They make fun of one another, but it never gets ugly. Yeah. Okay. And I think that comes from their respect for one another, but also the respect of the craft. Uh, that's my observation. Okay. Sure. Uh, and uh, for, and there's, for instance. For, for instance, when you when you fail, when you die on stage, okay, when it just bombs, yeah. After it's over, what will happen behind the scenes as either you're finishing or you're walking to your car in the parking lot? People come up afterwards, yeah, and they just automatically say, "This happens." This is this, this is this, this is what. They have their and, opinion. And that, to me, is um, <clears throat> pretty spectacular. Yeah. I, that's real. That's what I meant when I say the culture, they're living life as it's supposed to be lived yeah. rather than studying it. And it's not academic, okay? It's, it's just like when you were talking about Dink leaving here. Yeah. I mean, he's as real as you're going to get. Oh, I love it. Authentic, for sure. Yeah, that's he's right. one of my favorite guests so uh -huh. far. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it seems... Uh, a genuine person. And, and, and that's one thing I really uh, thirst for. I sometimes feel that, um, especially in a world of internet and social media, that people are playing sometimes a, a character of themselves. And sometimes I, I, it's it's... It's uh, it's it almost feels like they're um, they're creating, you know. Let's say uh, I, I have an image of myself or a description of myself, but then they create that description, and then that becomes a cage for them. Like all, all of a sudden, they're no longer able to be free, you know, be real and be. Outside I think of a that human being changes. I think you have a you. I, I strive for freedom, freedom to change my mind, freedom to express myself, freedom to be wrong. We don't make mistakes, right? And um, I don't know. I think in you know in in the current time that we live in, real and authenticity is it's a, such a breath of fresh air. I took an I I I crossed the line a couple of times, but let, mm -hmm. let's talk about the first time I crossed the line. <clears throat> and uh, I said something that I knew better, mm -hmm. but I thought it was funny. Yeah, is it the dog joke? But it's it was not... Uh, Politically It was correct? in bad taste. Okay. 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 <clears throat> and On so, whose line, though? And so I had uh, crossed the line, and um, the host, which I very much appreciated, burst it in and stopped me. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the middle of your set? And, uh -huh. and oh, so wow. I said, no, you know... Going too far. This, so then I adjusted, finished the set and everything. But what was so spectacular was 
I went back, I sat down, and I'm going to tell you, six individual comics descended on me. And they said, look, you didn't know this is what it is. And then they, they just counseled me right there mm -hmm. on the spot. Everyone um, was trying to help me. And uh, they were on your team. that you felt really meant uh, a great deal to me. That they were really in your corner. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. yeah they, they and, weren't going to abandon and, you. And they, they weren't. No, not at all. Not going to ban you. They just... It, it, it was really beyond reproach. It's interesting. Um, can, we, can we ask the context? Or? What happens is, uh, it, <clears throat> what happens is you, when you, you, can, you can make, if, if you're making fun of another individual, like we'll say another comic. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in this particular case, uh, I, ha I had picked out a comic that I really, really admired. Res yeah, okay, respected. A lot. Yeah. Okay. But I set it up in such a way, which I thought would be very funny, because she is young and I'm very old. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I had set it up in a sexual con. <laughs> and you thought what you did. And, yeah. and I thought, I thought everybody yeah. realized it's sort of stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's sort of stupid. But uh, astronomically, but it didn't, yeah. Uh, it, it, it hurt. It was feelings. wrong. I mean, yeah. it, it was it was a thing that uh, I'll never do again. Wish I hadn't have done. Should have known better to begin with. But that was the uh, that was uh, going over the the. the the line yeah. and they were absolutely correct. I mean, I, it was wrong. And, mm -hmm. and so you learn, but the part is when you said one thing, you can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a thing that happens because probably anybody that does this for any length of time, they're going to make a mistake. They're going to die. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're going, they're, they're, they're going to have bomb, bad days. Say the wrong thing. And then you're going to have some good ones. And then how do you recover from those those mistakes, how do you recover yeah. when you really didn't go over so good? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's that's one of the learning processes. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a habitual line stepper, and had I been there, to what it would have been funnier to me because my question to you is: I said because you're old that the joke didn't hit as well. I said you as the person telling the joke, like if somebody makes a similar joke or maybe drifts off that. But let's say, let's say it's um, a minority person of a different age. Would they be allowed to tell the joke? And the reason why the reason why I ask this question is because I probably had I been there, I would have gone right behind you and told the same fucking joke. <laughs> you know that's a that's a real good um, thought comment. I think. I think another person could get away with it. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think it would be bad taste. Yeah. yeah. But the way it's set up, like it was like an old man yeah. In... screwing around with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, that's about the only way I could sort of explain I, I, it. But, okay. So my father, he's 85 years old and he's a hound dog, let me tell you. Uh huh. <laughs> he, I think it's very actually kind of cute and funny because he's my dad and sometimes when we go to dinner he hits on the waitress and you know it's I don't know he's my dad and it's harmless in his instance and so I guess I have a more grace towards it that I feel like it's harmless uh -huh. you know what I mean and I don't know if other people have that experience that I have to apply it to but my dad's Old and kind of likes younger women, and it's funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny sometimes, and to other people, I bet it's uncomfortable. Yeah. I don't know what. What are you supposed to say to that? You know, I I think it's funny. I think my father's very funny, and I think he's very charming. And I think that in most instances, he's harmless. What you know, the, the thing when you look at humor, okay. Some people. Uh, 
Uh, and some groups are offended at one thing and they're not offended at others. Sure. And uh, of course, when you're, of course, when you're, when you're doing comedy, <laughs> you're pushing things to the extreme. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're trying to get people in your And camp. you're trying to misdirect and you're trying to catch them off guard and this type of thing. But let me give you an, let me give you an example of a thing that uh, happened with me that uh, I found to uh, be very interesting. Uh, I had this joke that uh, I would uh, uh, talk about cats. <laughs> and, uh, and it was inserted in the joke, and I would get uh, great laughs. Yeah. <clears throat> so I told, this was at, this was at Dirty Bull. And so I'd been performing, and as you know, I try to mix mine up. I try not to do the same thing. In other words, mm -hmm. like uh, what I did at Dirty Bull last night, I probably won't do that at Dirty Bull at least for another six months. Yeah. I appreciate that. In other that words, about what you. happens? I, yeah. I, 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 now I will take and do that same material at Zog's at Crafty. In other right. words, I'll do it different crowds. five to eight times, but in different places. But I try not to, I write down every time where I do it, and I try not to do the same set in the same place, you know, repeatedly. But anyway, I got to tell you this. This is about humor, which is innocent. The cat's pretty innocent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Told this joke, got lots of laughs before, did it at, at, at Dirty, got laughs, they just laughed. Going out to the car, my wife and I going out to the car. Two older ladies come up, and they said, uh, uh, Jim, they said, call me by my name, Jim. By Christian they said, name. we have come here every week just to see you. That was a real compliment. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We've come here every week to see you. To see you. But tonight, this cat thing, we <gasps> own cats, okay? And they're precious, and they're darling, yeah. and it just... After you told it, we couldn't think of anything else, and one of them started crying. Oh no! And so you know, uh, you what know, do you I do? just listened, and then they went off, and my wife and I we go get in the car, and I say, you know, that's a little oversensitive, you know, the cat thing, this thing, so so everything. So we get in the car, so we're driving, <clears throat> driving back uh, to Chapel Hill, and we're we're talking about it, and I'm. I'm sort of uh, uh, gotten, you know. I thought, you know, I didn't mean to offend anybody. Mm -hmm. And so we get about halfway home, and my wife said, well, uh, these are fans. And uh, maybe you might want to think about changing it. And I thought, well, wait a minute here. You know, you've got <laughs> ethics and, you know, this yeah, and yeah. I did this. So I get home and a couple of days later I got thinking, well, if I were to change that, what would I do? Okay. I took that same joke and I changed it to chihuahuas. <gasps> From cats to chihuahuas. Yeah. And I get a bigger laugh. Do you really? And no one's going to be offended because nobody. nobody out there has a chihuahua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious, and See, Jim. what happens is with some, this happens to be one that has really sort of got a unique twist to it. Mm -hmm. because, the capability because to change Because you, you, you've got these people that are following you. They like you and they're doing this. You offended them. Now, could you, you could just go ahead and say, well, that's the way it is. Because probably with a lot of the stuff, you're going to offend somebody. Yeah. Okay, there's going to be somebody out there you're going to offend. Yeah. And uh, so what do you do about that when, when you do something offensive? And I'm struggling with that. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, the, yeah. uh, the, uh, I try to be uh, very careful, but I still try to be, Provocative. Yeah. Okay. I still try to be provocative. Provocative in, 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 in the sense that it sounds like um, things that you're familiar with. Yeah. Things that you care about, things that you think are funny. Authenticity is important to you. You know what I mean? You're speaking to your experience rather than what's 
catered to. Yeah, I try to do that. Yeah, and I try to make it, um, my, my comedy, when I'm doing it, I don't tell jokes. And so my comedy is usually in a, in a story or a sequence. And uh, one thing that I do that is different or that at least I'm approaching it, I think, a little bit differently is this. When you read about comedy and you read about writing sets and you, and you, and you get into the craft, every book I have read, which I haven't read all that many, but I've read a few, they all talk about laughs per minute. Mm -hmm. And they want you to get a laugh every, on the average of every 15 seconds. Ooh. Okay, that's what they're shooting for. In other words, you get a laugh every 15 seconds, you're on it. Okay. And so what they do is they have you record, and then when you take it after it's over, then you go back and you count the laughs. And then some people will, will grade it like, the, the basic, the beginner just starts laughs, any laugh that you get. Mm -hmm. That's counted a laugh. Other people, as you get more sophisticated, put the laughs on a scale of one to five. Okay. Okay. Five would be almost like a standing ovation. A four, I mean, one would be like a titter. Okay. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. That type <laughs> yeah. of thing. Okay. And then, of course, they're going to average that out. You want a three, uh, you want to average a three every 15 uh, seconds. Now, in the, when I started finding this out and I'd taken a couple of courses, I started doing that. I started counting. And I started moving my material around so that I would get those laughs. And then what I did is I found out that for me, I'm not interested in a laugh. I'm interested in engagement. And so with me... Uh, when I step on stage, what I'm trying to do before I ever utter a word, I'm trying to get people to stop what they're doing and just look. And when I do that, all right, <clears throat> you got to realize the people in the audience, they're there to have a good time. And many of them are drinking, they're playing, they're talking to one another, they're socializing. And what I want them to do is for five minutes not to drink. If I can keep them from drinking, and that's what I look for. If they ever take a drink, I know I've lost. Them. And okay. so I'm looking this. So I'm looking. So I want stone quiet. All right. And I want to be able to hear a pin drop. Now, obviously, hopefully every once in a while, they're going to laugh every once in a while this. But between that, I want, I want it to be just mm -hmm. almost deafening, okay? Yeah. And uh, then uh, what I want happen at the end is, of course, I'd like for them to thank me and applaud, and I get off the stage. But when they're driving home, okay, I, I want them to think about either me or something I did or something that I said. And if I've done that, then I think I've, I've, I've done what I want to do. So I am more interested in engagement than I am in terms of laughs. Yeah. And I want to provoke thought. Uh, for instance, last night uh, when you saw, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, I provoke thought about age, how you get there, and then what happens. Because the people out there are going to get to my age. Okay? And so I'm hoping that when lucky. they drive home, yes. they're going to think, you know, I hadn't thought about that, but I'm going to live that long. <laughs> okay? And how about those bowel movements? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. how, how about those salads, yeah. you know, and then many of them are on salad. Yeah. Okay. And many of them like salad, but a salad is challenging. Mm 
Yeah. It's hard to get the lettuce out of the bowl. We were talking. I was talking about this with Andy earlier. I'm like, that's such a good joke. Because you're right. It sticks to the bottom of the bowl. Whether you like it or not. not good for it. Whether you, know? you like it or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah we yeah, like yeah, that yeah, joke. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's a yeah, good joke. Yeah. yeah. And so, so everybody could identify so the with that. The idea is, you know, when you finish. Uh, do people think about it? You know, you know, you, you'd like to get a, you, you, last night I got quite a few laughs. So I, I was, I was very proud of, of what happened, but the main thing is last night was one of those rare times when they absolutely were glued to me. And in other words, they watched and they couldn't, they were wondering what I was going to say next. Okay, and what I tried to do is I tried to put rhythm into it so I could catch them. But I'm going to tell you, I don't. When I looked out there and I did it, I think I went uh, uh, five minutes. She let me go an extra minute, and uh, I think I went five minutes, and I never saw one person take a drink. Nice. So Press mission up. accomplished. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but I'd like to to touch on something that you mentioned a, a little while ago, right? And um, I like I like the message because I tell Andy right like I I do hope that people think with with comedy right and not that you know I'm not the rule maker people don't want people to think with their comedy that's fine you know but it's almost to and the reason why I asked you earlier about well if you looked different will the joke hit and then so in that sense. And, and, and I'm a blunt object. I probably have a lot of maturing to do. But I think, fuck what they think. If somebody else can get away with a joke, then there's nothing wrong with a joke, really. It's like, all of a sudden, it's like, what? If, let's say, if I want to paint about the, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, I can't paint art because I'm not Russian or Ukrainian or have something to say. Or if I make a movie about something, what? Do I have to be the thing because uh, I, 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 you know, because that's the only way I can make art. And I, I, I've the reason why I started doing comedy is because I saw this happening where all of a sudden it's like nuance. It seems like the ability to recognize nuance is gone. And with it goes the ability to recognize satire. Right. And uh -huh. like, uh, like, uh -huh. I think a lot of your stories, there's a lot of satire. Like, I think, you, like, one of my favorite jokes, you have this joke, uh, dog joke that's almost like slavery in the South at Jason, but it's like it, you're talking about dogs the entire time. Yeah, you're yeah, never right. touching it. <laughs> you know, uh, okay. it's like you're in it. It's like it's almost like you're recreating kind of like a book, retells a story of what's kind of like happening or a particular concept. So I see a lot of this. Go ahead. Uh, no, that's oh, okay. that, yes, exactly. I, I want to make a comment, though. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. But I want to make a comment uh, along that same line yeah, about right. with using content as opposed to the personality. But mm -hmm. go ahead, keep going, yeah. and then I want to come back to that. Sure. Just don't let me forget it. Content and the personality. Uh-huh. Right? And, and, <clears throat> and that's, you know, I've even mentioned to you, right? Like, part of this is to meant to be disarming. And as I... I don't think it's fair that because I'm a minority that I can get away with shit that other people can't because that's not equality to me. It's almost like if, if you tell me that you can make a joke because you're, you're a white old guy and if somebody else can get away with the joke, how is that not fucking ageist and racist? You know, and at least that's my perspective. As a minority, as somebody that's been racially profiled, I have all kinds of friends. I always... And... It's, you know, like in, in Goodwill Hunting, right? Like uh, 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 free speech is the soul's right to breathe, you know? And if that freedom is, is, is uh, stifled too tightly, you know, like then, you know, you lose really what it means to be human. And the world is a rough place. In America, we, I think it's easy to have this sanitized experience, but it's how are we not creating a manufactured Fake reality. I, I always I, I think about about a lot of things, but I think I like I like to look at it from their point of view, and that's why I asked you a question, right? And, and even to people, right? I'm like, okay, I I like to understand how people come think, right? I think I have a good ability of it, and this goes with the whole like lateral, you know, like nonlinear thinking, where it's like, okay, let me understand your reasoning, 
okay? Because you see this a lot, oh, people are getting, okay, so this is what you believe, this is how you would reason it, okay? So let me change the scenarios and let me pick two extremes and let me pick your choose. We're gonna use your, your reasoning, now let's apply it to different scenario, using the same reasoning that you're using it. And in this scenario, it doesn't apply, then you, you're telling me that you're not used being as objective as you're thinking. I think the human mind is very easily, like I, uh, I tell Andy all the time, right? I think we have to, like I, I came from a science background, right? And that we have to mind instrument bias Right, because you could be looking through a microscope at a meteorite from outer outer space, and then you see some some life, some bacteria moving. You're like, "There's life in outer space," but you didn't check the lens that perhaps has bacteria already, or your sample is contaminated. So you have to mind the instrument bias, and I think with that, I think comedy has gotten to a point where. And that's why maybe I'm sometimes edgier than I would be if it, we didn't live in the current paradigm where people are thinking too much. I don't think comedy, a comedy is like music. It is like laughter is, you not cannot, well, you can fake laughter, but a real laughter is guttural. It is speaking to the very thing that makes us human in a sense. And I think that we have to be mindful of the instrument bias. I always tell like one has to be aware that we could be compromised. Everything that we think or feel could be compromised. And so a, a good exercise that I always say is like, well, we can rationalize ourselves. We know ourselves best. So we're the best person to bullshit ourselves, right? And, and a quick test is like, okay, could I be compromised? Is my rationalization of why I think something is true aligned with making me feel better or righteous or right? Because I think if that happens, that's a big red flag that it's probably not as subjective as we think. And that's why I asked you the earlier question about, well, can somebody else get away with it? That's right? a good question. And I think I think what I did is I answered, I think, yeah, they could have. I yeah. think you're absolutely right. So I think there's nothing wrong with a joke if that's the case. Well, sometimes I look at that as low-hanging fruit. Yeah, it may be. Yeah. In other words... Um, Being of a certain religion, a certain race, a certain gender, you're going to be able to say things with you being included in the joke that somebody that is not Jewish is the, probably the best answer. Mm -hmm. These people, they can say things about the Jewish religion that there's no way I could get away with it mm -hmm. and, and maybe even get a laugh. I'm not even too sure I could get a yeah. laugh but they will be hilarious. <clears throat> uh, that's probably the, the, best, the best example I can use. But I got a couple of perspectives here that I want to I mention to you that I want you to think about. Yeah. And I agree with everything you've said. <clears throat> One with content. I want to come back to the content. Yeah. You have a content, and then... <clears throat> uh, that time fades away, okay? Yeah. It could be like um, um, homosexuality. Yeah. Or it could be like Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Or it could be anything, okay? It, it, it comes and it goes. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use the example of Trump. Yeah. When Trump was president, he just wrote the material for you. I mean, yeah. I mean he was a gift to comics, the guy was funny, and you could make fun of him, and people would laugh, even if they were Republican or Democrat. It made no difference yeah. because of the things he said were so far out. Yeah. Okay. In other words, he was on the edge. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so he was perfect. Then he no longer becomes president, and we get Biden. Yeah. Now it's it's hard to make fun of somebody. That's not funny, okay? It's like you take a Biden, it's hard to make fun of somebody that is a nice person. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, they're a good well father. Well intentioned. Uh, what happens is uh, he has empathy, okay? He's married to a, live, to a person that, that, you know, is an educator. Uh, okay. he, he, he's got all these things. Okay, the point I want to raise is this. All right. 
I had this thing as everybody does with Trump and you're having your heyday with Trump. Yeah. yeah. But one of the, the things that I thought was funny with Trump was they started making fun of the length of his fingers. Yeah, yeah, and he was on the cover of Time magazine where they they showed his hand oh, okay, and he had yeah. short fingers. And, of course, the idea is people that have short fingers have short penises. Mm -hmm. This offended him, okay? And so he then gets on national television, mm -hmm. shows his hands and say, not only are my fingers, you know, so are there other parts of my body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Did he say that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. This out. was, this was, this was. I mean, this honestly, was he a, says so many this things. This was a, this was huge. At time. You got to remember, it was on, the, remember. It was on yeah, the front page time yeah. magazine. I believe you, but how many times has he been on the front page? How many times can <clears> I look? <throat> so, so anyway, so I come up with this joke about, I'm not really interested in Trump's taxes. I'm interested in his ACT score. Mm -hmm. Now, I know he's pretty smart, okay, but I was reading an article in the Inquirer where they had a picture of the turkey hand paint he did in first grade. And that's that turkey hand paint where you put it in paint, put it on there, and you make the turkey. And I looked in the lower right-hand corner, and he got a C. How could you get a C on a turkey hand paint? Yeah. And so I'm in education, you know, I look at it, I think I'm, and I realize the reason you got to see is the feathers were too short. Okay. And so I wouldn't, I, you know, if I were the teacher, I wouldn't give him a C. I'd written up an IEP on how to make a better turkey. And so, for instance, one, put hand in paint, two, take hand out of paint, uh, put it on the paper, two, three, put it on the paper, a uh, palm down, fingers outstretched. Four, slide hand down, half inch. Five, lift hand off paper. That definitely get him in the B range. <laughs> then I go on about Melania. Yeah. Okay, but just taken with Trump. Trump's out of office. Okay, Biden's in. Yeah. Okay. Take, put that in the folder. I call it putting in can. Okay, you put that in the can. You don't get rid yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it you put it over here in the can. Cold storage. Okay. And then <clears throat> I was talking with some and come up with the same thing you were talking about. And I thought, what if I took the same jokes I said about Trump and I put Biden in there? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll be damned. I tell the same joke about Biden and I got a bigger laugh mm -hmm. because... He's forgetful. In other words, yeah. he can't remember where he parks his car. He yeah. can't do this. He can't do that. So they never got the idea about penis or short fingers. Mm, yeah. They got the idea that he couldn't make a good hand, a turkey hand paint. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> because he's, so, yeah. And because, I okay. And so what happened is you, you had two contexts, same thing. Yeah. You just substituted words. And you still got to laugh. Mm -hmm. And I think that addresses a little what you were talking about, about you and this. Sometimes content can be placed uh, in different, in different, different types of yeah. settings. You, 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 that. Second thing I wanted to mention to you when you were talking about this is this, is that <clears throat> most comics think they're independent, mm. okay? And so they do things that are on the edge, okay? They, and, and they do things that go uh, beyond reason, okay? Mm. That's what makes it funny. The misdirection yeah. goes beyond reason. Now, if you look at it that the comic is not independent, the comic is interdependent. Now, let me explain this. For instance, my grandparents were dependent. They went through the depression, okay? They couldn't eat. They were dependent on the government. They had to do this, had to do that. All their lives, they were dependent and they were striving to be independent. Mm -hmm. So they raised my parents. So my parents come in and they, they're no longer dependent on the government. They're working, okay? 
and, and they're sort of living the American dream. And so they're striving to be independent. Mm -hmm. They want, they want two cars. They yeah. want, you know, a chicken in the pot. They want yeah. all this, you know? And so they're, yeah, the, so the big thing is, is yeah. independence. They raise me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I look at my parents and I say, well, that isn't what I want. Mm -hmm. Okay. What happens is I'm connected to the environment. Mm -hmm. I'm connected to the flowers. I'm connected. Oh, I'm connected to you. Okay. And then I realize not only am I connected to you, we're not separate. Mm -hmm. We're all one. So we're connected. Now, when you have that and you're a comedian, mm -hmm. what you do is your material now goes beyond engagement. All right. So for instance, like when, when <clears throat> like last night was a rare moment that I got in it, but I went beyond engagement. What happened is the audience became a part of me and they would not let me fail. Mm. Okay. And so there's no longer engagement. It's a step beyond engagement and they become inside of you. And so now this thing, so what I'm basically saying is the, the, the thing that you're grappling with, with yourself is yourself, who you are, what it is, what you can get away with, what there's nothing wrong with it. Do I feel guilty about it? Whatever it is. And that's when you're thinking independent. Okay, you're thinking that you stand alone. Okay. I would say later, as you go through, sometimes you might get a set or you might get something. And rather than you thinking you're delivering, mm -hmm. okay, that you are coming within where, where you're not talking to somebody, you're talking to yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we're all self. It's crazy, but to me, it makes sense. It's the ego mm -hmm. in the id. Yeah, See, yeah that's yeah. right. That's exactly, exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, it, 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 I think this Who is, uh, of course, we're talking with? about, you know, I thought we were going to come here and maybe talk about, <laughs> we're getting pretty deep here. I mean, <laughs> it's we're how getting, we get, we're getting, yeah. We're getting a little bit You'll deep. You'll have to come back for Castle Thinking. We're getting a little bit deep, but, but this, this, I think, what we just talked about here, okay, should be talked about at universities. Mm -hmm. You don't think it they're is? They're not. No. Why because do you what say they're that? doing with universities, they're preparing people for jobs. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. They're not preparing people to think. Okay. Okay. Now, maybe some that's classes the... are, but let me tell you, all you have I would to hope do, that's let me tell idea. you, all you have to do, and I know this, is graduate somebody and they can't get a job. I'm going to tell you, those parents are going to be all over you. Okay, but I taught your kid how to think. <laughs> I want my kid working. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so what happens is, yes, I think that the way university started out is they were to work with your mind, teach you how to think, you know, this thing. But I think what's happened is over the last, in my time that I was there 50 years, the last, I would say, 20 years of my career, things had changed where the universities were businesses. Yeah. In other words, they were getting, they were to get students, getting bodies students were to the pay, door. you were to bring in money. Yeah. And it, it no longer was the idea that you were there for knowledge or you were there well, to. I mean, it's interesting because I've read several articles recently about like Sarah Lawrence and Brown University, like targeting the opposite of what they've been known to target in the past, women and, you know, African-Americans and that sort of thing. And it's like these universities don't really care about you. They care about money. That's their goal. Their goal is to get people in the door that will pay them money. And those people that are the most that will give them the most money, whether it's grants or whatever it is, they want you. Like, 
That's it. That's good. I, I don't know what else to say about it. I don't want to feel like I, I'm pessimistic about it or anything like that, but I do genuinely think that it's, you know, our education system is about money. Well, the, 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 because I've been in it, and of course prior to being in the university, I was in the public school system. Oh, really? Okay. So I had worked in the, in, in the, in the schools and uh, still do volunteer work in the schools. Uh, I do volunteer work at, in Boone, North Carolina mm -hmm. with my daughter, Super third cute grade. Town. I have dyslexia. I have a very. Uh, Are you from that of third grade? Right. I have an interest. I have an in. I have an in. I have an 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 interest in teaching people how to read that that are struggling with reading. That's a big mm -hmm. thing to me. That's that's very huge to me. Because you feel like reading is important. Why? Uh, because first of all. I still have trouble reading. I can only read at sixth grade level. Okay. Okay. I've written books on reading. I've taught people how to read. I know how to teach people to read, but I can't read myself. Okay. Those who why don't do, know, why teach. do I? Why do I think reading? For, well, quick question: think, like this book right here, uh, Jim. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's right my there. memoir that just came out about uh, three months ago. Really? That, yeah, that book came out three months ago. That it was published in the Europe. It's published in Europe. You can get it through Amazon. Unfortunately, it's it's very expensive. In other words, by the time you pay uh, for the taxes and it, it runs $90, it's a very expensive book. Mm -hmm. But in that book, what I do is I talk about how I've navigated through life mm -hmm. not being able to read. Now... The reason why I think reading is important is because uh, you you use reading to learn. Okay, first you start out, you learn to read. Then after you get at the fourth grade level, then you're using reading to learn. So it opens up great avenues to you as you're able to read. Now, as you get into novels, you, know, you start experiencing things that, that you that can be experienced other ways, but you can experience through types of reading. You get into it. But, but let, me, let me give you a, a, a couple of examples about, I'm going to throw some numbers out here and just for, to illustrate a point. In other words, there don't look at these numbers as if they mean anything. I'm just Abstract numbers, yeah. But roughly 10% of the public school population struggle with reading, and when we say they struggle with reading, they're a year or more behind in reading. Okay, that's just sort of the way it is. All right, now, of that 10%, uh, half of them are going to learn how to read if somebody will just take the time and listen to them and talk with them and give them stuff to read. So yeah. half of them are going to read almost with no effort. Okay. In other words, they just need a little bit of individual attention. All right. So Before, that leaves me, you now 5%. Yeah. Let me interject right there with the reading because uh, my mom, she worked as a teacher assistant with uh, special needs kids. Right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, there was somebody there that apparently they thought they couldn't read, that they was mentally handicapped, you know. Um, and then, that you know, whenever they read, oh, they can't get them to read. She, like, you know, comes up to them. Turns out they speak Spanish. And it's not that they couldn't read. It's that they couldn't. Re they didn't know how to read in English. Yeah, nice. And all of a sudden, they were classified into this mentally challenged population. It's like, you know, this kid can read. You know, like this kid can understand the story, but not in a non-native language. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. This, this, the whole area of reading to me is just uh, absolutely fascinating. So let's. Okay, so now you got five percent. Okay. Now of that five percent. Three to four percent of those are going to be able to read if you have good diagnosis, a good remedial reading program, and they identify exactly what needs to be done and they sort of move on from there. That's going to leave you with about one percent, maybe two percent, but let's say one percent. I'm that one percent. In other words, I can't read uh, no matter how much you train me. I've studied all this stuff. I'm and I, I'm. I'm considered an expert in the area of reading. Okay, I am. Mm -hmm. But yet I can't read. But let me tell you what. Okay, here's, here's the thing that's interesting. 
First of all, I have uh, reversal and inversion problems. I can't tell the difference between a DB, P, and Q. Mm -hmm. So you show me a DB, P, and Q. Okay, I'm writing in elementary school. I'm writing in high school. I'm writing at a college. I'm writing as an adult. You would still see me mix those up, and mm -hmm. I can't see the difference. You'd think, that's visual, okay? I can type, okay? I know the home row, A, S, D, F, J, K, L, semi. Okay, I got it all. I'm going to write pain, my name, P-A-Y-N-E. Okay, that's here. Okay, little finger, right hand. I hit B. Oh, no. Now, look, so I hit B. It doesn't have anything to do with being visual. It has to do with the way your head's wired. Yeah. Okay, so what happened is, is your head, your head is... Is, is, is wired in such a way that it's going to get you mixed up, all right? So now they're going to give you, okay, these things that are words, okay, that are in there that are words, and instead of seeing was, you see saw, mm -hmm. all right? So this thing, so then they begin to train you, well, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do that. I'm 85 years old. I've gone through all that training. I still... Mix them, write them, type them. It's still the same way. So what happened with me about six years ago is I would I, I do a lot of volunteer work in public schools. I was working with second and third graders. And I looked at this 10% that were struggling. And they thought it was too hard. And they gave up. And I saw they gave up. Well, how do you keep from giving up? Well, what I found out was, this is what I believe, okay? And this is what I believe. And this is, gonna, this, is gonna, this is what the book, first chapter in the book is, the last chapter in the yeah, book. Yeah, you can is. get the rest on, okay. pay 90 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but this, 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 is, this is what it is. Is I found out these kids give up in other things, okay? And so they don't have any grit. They don't know about perseverance. They don't know about sticking to it. They don't know that when you have failure, you have to get back up, which, by the way, in comedy, that's what we have to do. When mm -hmm. you fail, you get back up, all right? And so I thought, instead of me teaching reading, because they're already in reading classes, and reading today, they, they've got some excellent materials out there. Everybody's got them, even your rural areas, all right? I thought, well, if I just taught kids to be tough with their mind, and so I came across the idea of teaching kids how to work a Rubik's Cube. And so I taught second and third graders mm -hmm. how to do a Rubik's Cube. Now, we started this out in, in a class in Dover, Delaware, and then mm -hmm. we went to Batesville, uh, uh, Mississippi, and then now we're doing it in Boone, North Carolina. We've run through probably six to 800 kids so far. Every kid that we've worked with has improved in reading. Every single one of them. I could I could give you I could give you information about these jumps, okay, mm -hmm. that these kids have made. So what happens is here's what here's what we try to teach them, is that you work this Rubik's cube and you're going to fail more times than you're going to be successful. Yep. And it goes in steps, and so we have them go through the steps. The people originally that were from Ruby's Cube were in uh, Arizona, I think it was. They heard about us. They flew in. Well, people that stick with a Rubik's Cube are gifted. In other words, that people buy Ruby's Cube, you get them for gifts or whatever it is, they usually end up in a toy box or end up at Goodwill because they're normal, mm -hmm. okay? They're not gifted. The only people that stick with the Rubik's Cube are people that are gifted. So... The programs that they have, that, that the people that produce the Rubik's Cube are all the gifted, and that's where the contests are. You're mm -hmm. going to have all these contests. They're all gifted. Well, what my daughter and I and my grandson, we developed a system to solve the cube the easiest, fastest way, because I'm in special education, like you said with your mother, okay, special needs. Yeah. I know what it's like to be a little bit mentally sluggish, mm -hmm. okay? So we, we have these kids. We have not had one kid give up on the cube. Not one. They keep working it. 
half of them, about half, it's not quite half, we'll say 40%, actually at second grade, yeah. okay, and third grade, solve the cube all the way through. They're able to solve it. Mm -hmm. But whether they solve the cube all the way through or not, that's not what the important part is. The important part is, is they don't give up. 100%. So at the end of the year, of course, now you have your tests, which show about reading. Mm -hmm. The tests that we've had that show such great strides in reading, when we showed them to the State Department, they shot, they thought we cheated. Oh, they wouldn't wow. believe that they wouldn't believe yeah. it. And of course, we were just doing it, you know, with volunteers or this type yeah. of thing. But then all of a sudden, what happened is we looked at their math scores. And their math scores would be like the average math score jump was like 1.8. Mm. Okay. Reading scores would be 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 okay. Okay. And so what we, and we didn't do anything with the reading program. We didn't try to teach them how to read. They went through the same reading program. So what we think we've Sorry, told them is don't give up. Mm -hmm. That's what we think. And so I think a lot of uh, problems with reading, but I think a lot of problems that we have uh, in the educational system is uh, uh, we might focus on a, on a skill, but we don't focus on grit we don't, we don't focus on toughness mental toughness uh, and uh but you have to do it in a fun way you can't do it in a boring way you can't uh, now, yeah. i don't know whether that has anything to do with the podcast or no, anything I, but that it 100 that, does. that, that is does, what yeah absolutely. that is what um I, I can tell you i'll go to the bank on that I, I mean i know what i'm talking about i'll go with you to the bank on that let me show you a video that i think uh it's very uh pointed. i don't know if you've ever watched the rocky movies Yes, I have. Okay, and then you may recognize this speech here. Hold on. Did the time come for you to be your own man and take on the world? And you did. But somewhere along the line, you changed. You stopped being you. You let people stick a finger in your face and tell you you're no good. And when things got hard, you started looking for something to blame, mm -hmm. like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving <laughs> forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. Boy, that's, that's wisdom right there. Working with a kid's second grader, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, she's working on the third step, which is the middle layer, okay? The first two steps are the top layer. Mm -hmm. Working on the middle layer. Middle layer is a little bit complex, okay? She works at, she, you got to do eight, got to do eight different moves. Okay. And, uh, so she works at, works at, finally what happens is uh, she gets it. And then, and the way we do it, okay. She's working on that, on the, on the middle layer. She gets it. Then we give her another cube. Mm -hmm. Okay. She gets it. We give her another cube, gets it. Get five cubes in a row. Okay. Boy, she's so proud of herself. And she says, I said, man, this is good. She says, it's like drawing an elephant. She says, it's hard, but if you stay with it, you can do it. Now, I was thinking, here's a second grader relating to the cube mm -hmm. about drawing an elephant. Yeah. Okay. Cause she made that think correlation. About, think about a kid, you know, they can draw a horse, a cat, a dog, but they get that damn elephant. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah. love that. That's a fantastic. And so she's yeah. saying to me, this is what I've learned. It's yeah. like drawing out. You got to stick with this cube. She had uh, a two-year gain in reading. Yeah. Two-year gain in reading. And uh, it, it's the thing that, that, they, they, uh, that the kids say 
which I have in the book, sometimes will make you cry uh, because they're so insightful mm-hmm. and you, uh, you, you realize it's, it's, uh, it's really something. I know that we were coming into December. The kid comes in to work the cube and he turns to me and he says, Dr. Payne, he says, uh, I was at Walmart and he said, uh, I saw Santa Claus and Santa Claus is buying toys. I said, come on. I said, that wasn't Santa Claus. He said, yeah. He said, uh, red suit, white hat, beard, black boots. He said, it was Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I thought the elves were supposed to be doing that. Are they on strike? (laughs) (laughs) And so what does he do all this strikes? stuff going on. It, I mean, you never know what, where they're they're, they're c- coming from. And then after he tells me all this, then he comes and he starts working the cube. Okay. Yeah. So what 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 you provide this environment, okay, where it's tough, okay, but they see themselves making progress and they're proud of them. Oh gosh, they'll go home. They'll go home and show their parents. Their yeah. parents right, can't yeah. believe it. Their parents can't believe it. Yeah. Parents brag on them. So they begin, you talked before about that, they, they, their ego. Yeah. They, they begin to realize they're smart. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They may not be the sharpest pencil in the box, but they're pretty smart. Teach children that they want to learn. Isn't that something? You have to teach them in a way that they want to learn. Yeah. You yeah. know, they're, they're tricked into learning almost. That's yeah. almost, yeah. That, that's sort of, that's sort game. of what we're doing here. You've hit it. It's a trick. Yeah. In other words, what we're doing is we're using the cube to show them, first of all, we've got it down to where we've got it in small increments so you can see yourself moving through the process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that's, that's one thing we've done. We've, we've looked at the, the process, the curriculum, the instruction. Uh, and then, of course, we give them the opportunity, and we've learned a lot of things about it. Uh, about how to break it down and so we we've had uh, we, we uh, th- when they flew in when the when the Rubik's cube people flew in to see us at Batesville they they were shocked because the people we had were not gifted mm-hmm. okay and they'd only been dealing with and all of them were gifted yeah, everybody yeah. that flew in everybody that works for the Rubik's cube they're gifted mm-hmm. yeah. okay. And they run those contests. They're gifted. They were always at the top of their class, whatever it is. They come in and here's, plus we have those special needs kids in here. Yeah. We had uh, kids in there with the IQ, uh, whatever you believe about IQs, anything, in the low 50s. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. That's pretty low. All right. These people are struggling. And they were, they, they were able to do the top layer. They were able to. But the part that was so great about it was not one of those kids had ever given up. Yeah. So even though they were still on the top layer, they went the entire year, okay, 190 days, okay, and never quit yeah. and never got bored. Yeah. They would stick with it. And that's, that. when you're coming back, that, that's, that's, we think that's important. I, I think it's critically important. It actually touches on something that I, I mentioned to you before when I saw you yesterday and that you inspired me to, like to find words, like I, you know, like I, I tell uh, Andy that sometimes I, uh, for example, absurdism, right? Like, uh, or I like contents that just if you think, things from the past got developed by thinking, so you can arrive at something. You're like, okay, I don't know exactly the term, the jargon, but I can describe it, and then you find, oh, somebody else has talked about this, and um, you really open my mind with uh, non-lateral thinking because I, you know, I have not many met many like myself, right? I'm uh, one pattern out of many, right? But I haven't met that many. And I want to, I want to write, I'm going to write a book. It's called Finding the Why, because I think part of giving up, I think a lot of people do look at their lives linearly. You look at everything linearly. They see the past, the present, the future, and where they think the future is, except the future is not really real. The only real thing is the present and our memory surface makes whatever we want of our past. And it's one of those, it's, it's called, it may not be the theme, but it's called finding the why, 
right? W H I, but the Y is actually a double entendre as an axis. Because if you think about just X linear, you just have one dimension, right? You introduce a Y, now you have two planes where you have a lot of paths. And I think a lot of people, and I think this is tied to with this, the difference between a victim and a survivor mentality, where I think because of that linearity of people's minds, of, of most people's minds, and I, am, I fall for prey to it too, they, they're like, I did this. I, I, it's kind of like going on a trail. If you go on a trail... There's a map. You're like, okay, I'm going to cross the bridge, you know, after a mile, and then there will be a lake on my side. And people will be like, oh, well, no, I followed the path right, almost rationalizing. I did the right things. And, well, uh, the I, you know, the lake isn't here. The lake should be here. I did all the right things. And then they sit, and then they, they're stuck in that place. They Because they did not consider that maybe, oh, you know what, I should be seeing this by this. If not... Maybe I need to take a step back. Maybe I went on a different road. Maybe the road was washed out. Maybe the bridge came down. And I think, this is why I want to write this book, because I think that it creates a lot of grief for a lot of people and a lot of, like, giving up. And I think where this is, like, not, like, I always say there's more than one way to skin a cat. And I think that if people are able to think of different potential paths, right? I always I, th I always think of it as patterns, right? Okay, does this pattern right now, the reality that I see for, for see that I see in my life fits this pattern. I always call we all we all do what we, we all have the patterns what we hope will happen, what we think will happen, and then what we expect will happen. And then there's the all the other variability of what could happen, right? And I think a lot of people overlay what they hope, what they expect, and what's most probable to happen right on top of it. So all of a sudden, when it doesn't happen, they're not able to see any other path. They don't see this actually an entire infinite number of variables of paths. And I think being able to see the nonlinear of the paths and we are emotional beings, so of course we want what we hope will happen, and what you know the what we expect to happen, or what's probable to happen to be the same. But it isn't always the case, and I think being aware of the other things really can help us overcome this giving up, this victim. I think that's the difference between a, a survivor and a victim, because a survivor has probably been victimized, but they're not stuck, they're not defined by it, because they're like, okay, I kind of like a train track. I was on this train track, and I should have been there, but guess what? You were moved to another train track, so you're no longer on the train track. And the longer you don't realize that you're not living in the reality that you thought you were is going to be the longer that it takes you to actually get to where you need to go because now you're like, oh, I'm on this different train track. Maybe if I want to go here, there's a different way than the linear thing that I thought. It's like, no, I did all the things. What the hell? Why am I not there? And then you sit there. And... um I think, I think it, it ties in with that grid, and I, you know, like I think immigrants have this a lot, or people that have experienced trauma and have been able to overcome it because they're like, okay, I did not expect this to happen, and now I have to live with the reality of this because life just is. It doesn't have to be fair; it just is. You know, like that infinite wheel of what could happen will land on somebody, right? And I think. Being more cognizant of that is critical because I don't think people are thinking anymore. I think people have traded the ability to, and I heard this somewhere, the ability to think for the ability to search. People think that they can search for the answer, not think about the answer. And I, and, and, and at the root of that, I think come a lot of ails that we see in the modern age. You know, I don't know. I went off on Rand, of course. No, no, you didn't. Uh, what you're saying is complex, okay? It's got mm -hmm. many layers to it. Uh, I want to just come back on that same thing that you're talking about with the wheel. Yeah. Come back to what you had mentioned to me. W why is reading important? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're saying, well, wh why do you want them to read? And I, I used it because I think that people that can read, they have other avenues open maybe other wheels that you can spin off of. Sure. Uh, you've got other directions. But I, I want to come back to this because I'd forgotten this. This is why I want to come back to that because I think that was, that, that was really one of the reasons why I wrote the book or I wrote my memoir. 
I w- it was Christmas, and my son's wife, she t- teaches um, English as a second language immigrants. Mm-hmm. And she says to me, you have to write a book about your life. Mm-hmm. And I said, what are you talking about? And she says, how you were able to survive without being able to read. And the, these kids that I have, all of them are struggling with reading, okay? And uh, I, I thought, what, what are you talking about? And she said, no, what happened is this. So coming back to your question is this. I look at this uh, 10%, okay? You've got 90% not going to have any trouble, okay? They're going to read without any instruction, okay? Just like we learn to talk yeah. without instruction. They're going to learn it. Okay. Then you've got this 10%. Of that 10%, with very, very little effort, okay, we can, we can get them to, to be literate. Okay. Then we've got another 4%, 3 4% this. Okay. Then we've got people like me. Okay. Now that comes up with why do you, have, why do you want people to read? Well, with that 1%, I don't want people to think they're stupid. Okay, I, I, with that 1%, I want them to know you're not able to read, you're not going to be able to read, you're going to die not reading, okay? But that doesn't mean it's like we saw Rocky here, okay? And you just keep on going. Mm-hmm. In other words, you look at others. Mm-hmm. And so what the book does is yeah, it starts out with the thing about what we did in Batesville and how we're doing the Ruby's Cube, and it ends with... Uh, two or three chapters, and I call them afterthoughts. So we have the forethought, the afterthought. Then you start the real chapters. The real chapters start in about how I failed third grade because I couldn't read. Then I repeated third grade. Then finally what happens, I finally graduate from high school illiterate, but I graduated from high school because back in those days, you really didn't have tests. Well, also, if you had a degree, they had to let you into college even though you weren't capable. So I go to college and I can't read, Mm -hmm. okay? Well, I struggle, then I go to junior college, then I come back, and then I find out how I can sort of maneuver around the system a little bit. And then, of course, then I go on and I ended up in graduate school, and then I end up getting my doctorate, and then I'm teaching at a prestige, and I start writing about all this. But, But all the jobs I had, other than the university, how I maneuvered, through whether I was in the restaurant business or whether I was in the iron foundry or whether I was in the oil fields or whatever I was, okay, I was maneuvering through life. And in all of those jobs, you didn't have to be able to read, okay? You had to be able to work. You, you, it didn't, it didn't have to, you didn't have to be able to read. Then I come from a rural community and I realized, okay, you've got the 90% that can read, but they don't read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're working a farm. Okay. So they don't need to read. So so here you've got, you're working all this thing when you come back. Well, why do you want people to learn how to read? You've got all these people that can read that choose not to read. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, in my life, I begin to think because I can't read, you know, I'd give my left arm if I could learn how to read. But what happens is... I begin to to think about if a person has the gift to be able to read, I think it's sinful that they don't read. Sure. Okay. And so that's sort of my perspective on it. But coming back to this thing is the reason I wrote the book was to say, for those of you that are struggling with reading, you can probably read. For those of you that can't read, forget it. Because life goes on and there's things out there much more important than reading. Yeah. And so you maneuver through. So what I tried to do is I tried to show how I survived in high school. How I survived. Uh, uh, what's the play guy? To your what, Winkler, what's yeah. the guy that played the phones? He has dyslexia. Oh, yeah, yeah. What he said, they asked yeah. him one time, they said, well, here you are. You can't read. Okay, you were. You know, you're. You do all this. Made all this money. How did you survive? He says, "This was so insightful." He says, "When you can't read, you learn how to tap dance." 
<laughs> that's so funny. Um, that's so, let me so give, you tap dance through life. Let me give you an anecdote from my mom. Right, so she was a teacher assistant, uh, and she had a teacher that didn't like her. Right, so it comes parent teacher day. It's it's uh, I think they're you know first grade or kindergarten. And parents, you know, you're supposed to give the lecture about what you tell the kids. Well, she doesn't speak the language all that well. She doesn't speak English all that well. She can write it. She can read it. But she can't speak it. And her job's on the line, right? Because parents are like, how can you teach here if you don't speak English? So she came up with the idea. She's like, well, I can't speak it, but I can write it or write it. So what she did is when she came, she's like, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't. I don't know. <laughs> She's, she's faking it like she could here you go. Will you read what? And then she had one of the parents read the things that she wrote. You know, so all of a sudden she's able to give the lecture and then it goes right to the tap dance thing and finding a different way. Because what is she supposed to do? Give up? Sit yeah. there? What a great story. What a great story. Now see what happens is this is the this is the type of thing. I think we need to get out. In, in other words, there, I've, through my life, I've failed academically every mm -hmm. time, okay? Because I can't compete academically. Mm -hmm. I just can't, all right? But that doesn't mean I can't think, mm -hmm. okay? It doesn't mean I can't do things, okay? Yeah. Uh, and the funny part about it is I can't read, but I can write, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? Now, that's the crazy part. Now, I can't write without help. I have to have an editor. I have to yeah. have a story editor. So I look at the I have QSPs, to have a proofer. These, yeah, I have these. to have this. Now, one thing I've found with the computer, okay, is with spell check and everything, it has helped me a lot, hmm. okay? And a lot of people make funny, make fun about things correcting you. You got automatic correct everything. But it has helped me, okay? And I think that's a, that's a method that's going to help some of that 10%, yeah. okay, as they're able to do it. And uh, we're finding more and more uh, 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 things about reading that are, uh, uh, are are helpful with people that struggle. The thing that's very interesting to me is this. I was asked this question when I wrote the book. Uh, well, when you have a book and you and you're looking at it, what do you see? In other words, people that read must see something different than you see mm -hmm. because you can't see it. Well, I used to answer that in such a way like I did before. I have reversals, inversion problems. I have a short-term memory problem, long-term memory, this type of thing. Yes. But that's not the answer. Okay, the answer is this, is that as we talk, we're using words, but you don't hear the words. Mm -hmm. In other words, you hear the thought, you hear the feeling, yeah. you hear whatever it is. When you guys read, you don't read words. Okay, it's stories, it's meaning, it's substance. Yeah. Okay, when I see it, I see words, or I see letters, mm, or I yeah. see the letters that I'm trying to make out of words. And so that's the difference is the people that struggle with reading are not seeing the same thing that readers see. Have you noticed, have you ever done an experiment and I've come upon this? I, I do it just personally because I like it. Uh, I love the feeling of, of, a, of a book, book in my yeah. hand, right? Because uh -huh. then I'll write, I, I highlight, I get ideas from it. Um, but now there exist audiobooks. So, but a very cool way to do it is to listen to the audiobook while you're reading the book, you know, because all of a sudden you can hear the words as you're seeing them. So I don't know if you have, you know, actually, that, I've you never know. didn't think about it. I yeah. never that's 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 clever. Either, yeah. That's clever to okay. make the brain associate. It's very very things, clever. You know? That's a that's somebody ought to do a study on that. They should. Uh -huh. yeah. I have uh -huh. all these ideas that I can't use myself, you know. <laughs> Somebody, you know, you uh, could use them. Maybe. Um, I, I don't. I don't think I would be able to have the follow through to just stick myself to that project, which would be massive in itself. You, you know? can do it. You know, capability, sure, but I, you know, I like figuring out things and then like the operation, operational, the opera, operationalization of them. 
let them, you know, let it scale, you know, somebody else. You know, I'm not, uh, as, as I tell Andy very often, right, I, um, I've discovered that I, I don't live, I don't see money in the, I guess, in the way that most people see it. I see it, the money is translating to experience and what you can do with it. Maybe now, and obviously, you have to be mindful of the future because maximize the, the 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 human experience that you're having and you know you don't know how long you're gonna live and similarly with time I feel like we're so trained almost you know like conditioned to at certain times or, or do certain things that we all do and I it's difficult for me to have that pacemaker in time time does not flow in my mind as it does I still like to do other things but I I don't know. I have difficulty sticking to a routine because my brain doesn't work as in a routine. My brain doesn't work like that. And uh, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge. My observation of you is a little different. Is I think you're, for, for instance, when before we sat down, before you got the camera going, you said I started at noon today. Yeah. Okay. And then you start going through. Now, if you think you don't have good time management, you're crazy. <laughs> okay. What what happened is, as you're talking, I'm thinking, how how's he do it? Now, not now, now. Let's come back to this just a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not how you did it from noon on, mm -hmm. but how did you get everybody here? How did you contact these people? How did you set all this equipment up? How did you get Angie come in here, sitting here with the side of you, the two of you doing this thing together? Okay. Th that's not random. It's not. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you say you're not real good in terms of the linear type thing, okay, I don't believe that at all. In other words, you've got a part of that, but it's not important to you. So you take yes. it for granted and you use it, but you use these other things because they turn you on more. You're sort of yeah. anti-linear, okay? The way I, the way you talk with me, I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> talking out of the <laughs> side of my mouth or something. I don't That's know what I'm doing, but yeah. what I'm saying Continue. is, as, as you're talking to me, I'm getting this idea of a complex person, which you are, Okay. Sometimes. But what but what what <laughs> but what happens is to think that you're not linear, I think that it's like saying uh, you know when you you walk, you walk without thinking. Mm -hmm. I think the linear part comes to you without thinking. In other words, somehow you miraculously contacted all these people, plus how many people did you contact that said no or they couldn't make it? Mhm. Mm that's complex. <laughs> okay. That takes planning. That is linear. Funny, funny enough that you say it, the majority of those people, I got the ball contacted yesterday, last night, from like, we only had <laughs> two or three, three people. Got, we yeah, only had two or three people. Like, we, went, we went from three people today to seven, like after last night. And, and I think that that's actually where we differ in a lot of ways is that it's not linear and nonlinear or anything, but it's like we are so interested in that human connection. And I think that that shows I think that it shows that in our authenticity and the way that we want to communicate with other people, we really like you and we yeah. want you to be here. Well, not just me. What happened is I watched, you know, before I watched a couple of months ago when I came in as an observer and, um, my observation of the two of you is you're not separate. Okay. You're one person. <laughs> All right. It's, I mean, it's crazy because you yin and yang off of one another with no effort. And it's almost my observation two times is that you're not out thinking one another, but you're in sync in your yeah. thoughts. And so one comes to the other and it unfolds and it's beautiful. And then on top of it, 
you have the affect, the feeling for the people that are sitting here where I'm sitting. In, in other words, you really don't see these as people. What do you mean? You see these as uh, experiences because you're drawing from these people their lives. That's fair. That's exactly what yeah. you're doing. Well, we, now, somehow you've developed that skill. Now, you could have been born with it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I doubt if you were taught it. No, I... Um, I think, I think we like think, people, Angie? though. I think, I, think, I think we genuinely... I mean, we, in separate parts of our lives, are very much people persons. Mm -hmm. You know, we like other people, and we separately have very you know, uh, unique interactions with a lot of kinds of people. And I think that it's given us a unique perspective as far as appreciating a lot of different kinds. You guys come from different backgrounds too. We do. You're yeah. able to move around in different ways. We're different, we're different people, but we, we appreciate what our differences are and, and hopefully and they're, you know, complimentary. And, and I got to give it to Andy. Like, I am not, I know I'm not an easy person to sometimes understand or even I am very, I like to think that I'm a, a kid of Roger said, like, you don't care. You know, you don't give a fuck. I'm very confident in myself and I, I feel like, and I have a lot to learn, but I feel like I understand what I understand about life and what life could be, what life couldn't be. And it's um, Andy really, uh, like, to your credit, she's a very kind and patient person because I am sure that I could turn a lot of people off. And to where you say with the linearity, I mean, even in a multi-path, you have to take a certain path, right, got, and adjust. Oh, you're not going to make it. That's uh, right. I, I have to be inspired to do the things like it really as you mentioned it doesn't turn me on it's like but if i am on like i like you know i will follow that you know almost with two feet in like you know how did the two of you come up with this idea <laughs> and then gradually you put it all together i mean people that are watching here can't see all this equipment equipment okay. my god this blows my mind. It looks well, great, okay, doesn't it? It's great. Arturo, it's but spectacular. You don't even understand. It is spectacular. Arturo has been working it. on this iteration as long as I've known him seven years. Is that right? From seven years in the in, in, from his closet to now, this has been a, a like an a, evolution, genuinely. With a lot of gaps in between. With a lot. Well, only but, once we really start doing it together have I been able to sequentially do it. I couldn't do this without Andy. And the, like I say, we are manly girly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. See, you're, we this is We each other. Yeah. Okay. You couldn't do it independently of one another. Yeah. Uh -uh. Right. No. That's where you get that interdependence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where you get that interdependence. Yeah. I, I just, I'm, I'm just, uh, well, of course, see, coming two months ago, then coming back and just seeing the, the changes you've made on the walls. Do they look I mean, great? It took, Do you love well, them? Well, yeah. I walk in the door and I was wondering, is this the same place? You know, he, I could no, not believe were, it. In two months, this has changed at least 10 times. I'm not even kidding you. You have seen this. I don't even live in the same house. It's like, great. It's, it's insane. And, and the idea is, we've talked about it, is, is that every time that you come in here, you as a guest, the royal you, you look at this wall and and every surface in here is interesting, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, right? Like and you they all can have look a story. At, they like do, this yes. Has yeah. This has a story. That has a story. It does. Okay, when you start telling me, everything in and here And we want to tell you about it because we're excited to talk to you about us too. Well, well you just reminded me of something, right? Uh, and this is what uh, I also put, put it in the book eventually is... I see these memory markers. I think we can only maintain, right? We forget things. We can only maintain so much in our heads. And I'm against this whole minimalism movement. I think uh, all these memory markers, I sometimes like to think if I lost my memory, put me where I live, and maybe this will strike because uh, like that thing, my brother gave it to me, my mom gave me that. I remember I was really into comics when I bought that. That is from an, an article 
I heard that is when we went thrifting. My mom made that painting. This is when I went to a show. Andy painted that thing. This one I was really into comic books. I love Ross because they always have great art for cheap, you know. Uh, that's from a show that reminds me. This thing is a woodworking thing that I made behind. And it's one of those things where it's like, I, I, I don't know if consciously or unconsciously, I take it outside of my mind so that then I can put more stuff in. And then back out, you know, and uh, and it's a mess, like my mind is. <laughs> Great, but I really appreciate. That is interesting. Like, you know, like your kind words. I uh, very much. I uh, I tell Andy that, uh, for example, in the rearranging, there is sometimes a lot of mess, and I can. I'm not. A, I'm not good at learning, and I'm not a good teacher, because most learning is done step by step one spoonful at a time and i'm it's difficult for me to do that with i need to see it in the entire thing mm -hmm. and then progress and similarly with this arrangement like in my mind i see it i see like oh there's this mess this has to go in this room and this will come out of another room as, as andy i tell her i'm compressing things and, and sometimes you're like oh how does how does this all fit and um but that same ability to see i tell her that is it's uh, <laughs> I don't mean to get emotional. It's a very lonely place sometimes, you know. Uh, uh, I uh, it can be a blessing and a curse, but a lot of times it's like because we live in the world as we live, I don't have. It's difficult for me to explain what I see when I don't have the tools to explain it. You know, uh -huh. it's like sometimes uh, it's <laughs> I'm getting a little emotional, but it's uh. It, it's great and it can work in my for my benefit and it, it's an ability that does have you know you know as you mentioned a lot of people are like oh how do you do that but at the same time my ability to sometimes communicate and have show people what I see whether I'm crazy or not can be a very lonely place you know so if anything that's why I also mentioned that the words that you gave me like allowed me to go down a rabbit hole and understand more about myself by then having the search terms that I can search for and then expound on, right? Like Edward de Bono, how to have a beautiful mind and not linear thinking, calm with an absurdism and like tying to grit, right? Like um, the myth of Sisyphus, right? Like if, uh, are you familiar with the myth of Sisyphus, I imagine? Yes. Uh, right? Okay, uh, for anybody that's watching and doesn't know, cursed by the gods to put a uh, push a stone up a mountain and when it gets to the top it rolls down to the bottom and then you have to do it all again an allegory to our everyday life getting up going to work or really applied to a lot of things and it's and i tell this to some of our podcast guests i'm like think about like even getting paid for the show or whatever how much of that time or winning a score how much of that that time is spent in that success time the rock at the top, and how much is the grind? So you have to picture Sisyphus happy. That's it good. is the journey that is the destination, and um, I um, it, and it's difficult to sometimes you know like explain that or like it's easy to explain, but it's not easy to explain the inside of what that really means applied to everything really in life. It's like because. If most of life is the struggle, enjoy the struggle because, right, like the most essential philosophical question, should I kill myself or have a cup of coffee, right? <laughs> and it's like driving meaning in our lives and we, we're as human beings, we can create our own meaning. And this is where I always, where I always say that there's no way to fail in life by living it, by being yourself. It's one of those things like, well, you can be yourself, you can strive for meaning, you can create new meaning, you know? Back to the multi-path and being a victim. Well, if it didn't work out that way, you have to get up and create new meaning. Okay, maybe if I lost my legs, I can't play basketball. But what is really the underlying mechanism of what basketball does for me, right? Is it the fact that I like the camaraderie? Do I like the activity? And can I use do something else that plugs into those holes? Because maybe it's not basketball that I love. Basketball has these components that I love, and then up, you find another pattern that fills that spot. And I think you have to go the layer beneath, you know, just the surface and be like, well, what's the meaning? What's the real pattern underneath? What is this really 
this really filling in. But then I talk about that, and it's not like a madman, you know? Like, uh, so that's well, why I, I feel very happy about seeing these things and being able to. And ideally, uh, Andy will tell you, like, I, I hope that even in the podcast, some of the younger people that we talk to, that I can help them, you know, that, that is useful in their lives. I, you know, I say, we can't, literally, you have no control over what anybody else is going to do, just the choices that we make. And I hope that that gives them at least kind of like, you gave me the search terms, but it can be difficult if, let's say, people are not thinking and they're just searching for an answer. Like, oh, no, well, I've searched for the answer. And that's not what it is. Like, well, think about it. Maybe, I'm not saying it is or not, but think about yourself and what you're doing. And yeah, I, I um, you know, I guess every human being wants to be misunderstood and being a little bit eccentric and a little bit off. Don't get me wrong. I, I wouldn't trade it. But uh, one of my biggest things is that it can be a very lonely place. You know? I don't know. I, I, as you're talking different things go off in my mind. Uh, and the, when you say, you know, what would happen if we lose our mind? Mm. Uh, I, I'm not afraid to die. I know I'm going to die. Yeah. I, I don't want to accelerate my death. Okay. Right. But yeah. I'm not afraid I'm going to die. I've come close to dying three times. In yeah. fact, three times I was supposed to die and I yeah. didn't. So I just keep on going. And on those three times, every time I've told the doctor, "Look, this isn't worth. This is too painful. You know, this isn't worth it." Yeah. You know. And every time, whoever was working with me, it was usually a doctor, not a nurse. Uh, they would say, "No, you stick. With, yeah, it's going to be painful, but you, you're going to make it. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're going to make yeah. it." Going through therapy, I mean, the purpose of therapy when you get is to hurt you, okay? Mm. They got to hurt you for you to get better. And then, of course, when you get back and then, you, and then you're sort of able to go. But one thing that I think about is I worry what happens if I lose my mind because at my age, okay, now let me explain this. Everybody I golfed with is dead. Mm. Not one person is alive. They're mm-hmm. gone. Okay. People that were my colleagues that I taught with, over half of them are gone. Okay. Most of the other half are in nursing homes. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's harsh. And w- I think about what would happen if I lose my mind, just like you do, just like you said. And that is frightening to me because I don't. So then I get the idea of this. What is life? Okay. Now, I don't know. This podcast has gone a little further. No, this is you know, great. Like, I, really I thought, well, we're we going to talk about comedy. Yeah, and we're yeah, yeah, yeah. talking about a lot of stuff. That's yeah. We're talking heavy. about you. But let's yeah. talk about this just a minute. Yeah. Okay. My. Mother-in-law lived to be 99 years old, almost 100. She missed it by a few days. Mm -hmm. Okay, she passed away. But the last five years of her death, she was comatose. She was not conscious, okay? She was fed through her veins, okay? Prior to that five years, the five years prior to that, my job was to bathe her and clean her, and my wife's job was to feed her. Mm -hmm. Okay, then... She had to then, we just physically couldn't do it, so then we had to have a, a, a medical Caretaker. care, yeah. you know, so she was in a nursing home. But she never got out of the bed for five years, mm-hmm. okay? All right, and we'd visit, didn't know who anybody was and everything. And uh, she didn't have a living will. She didn't have anything. So when we talked about taking her life, okay, the doc said, no, you can't do that because this is it. And so then they began to explain to me, life was a hard heartbeat. Okay. Mm. And then I got thinking, that can't be right. Right. In other words, uh, life is, is something different than a heartbeat. Now, I don't know what you call what we're doing here, 
but this is not life. What we're doing here is life. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But this has nothing to do with our heart beating. Right. Okay. And so it, it's giving me a fact. So then we get into this situation. We're heart storming, like that, brainstorming. We're heart storming. <laughs> okay. That's right. So then we get into these, these areas that are real hot now about abortion or right to life or whatever it is. And what I'm trying to think is the reason that doesn't make a lot of sense to me is because some of these people, they make the decision based upon when does life start? Mm -hmm. You know, when does the heart beat? Yeah. Well, if you take away that concept, okay, that life isn't a heartbeat, it opens up when you start talking about these different, ang you know, the wheel spinning, yeah. the different thing coming off. Now you got a different things on the wheel, okay, that are coming around mm -hmm. because you're thinking, well, wait a minute. If that's not life, what is life? Yeah. Okay. Then, you know, whose life is it? All right. Is it the mother's life, the father's life? When I have got a comedy thing, I'm fascinated with this. I got a comedy thing. It says, you know, uh, I'm against abortion until the age of 15. I believe any mother can make an informed decision as to whether to abort or not. And You're not 15, wrong. <laughs> if the decision is made to abort, there's three choices, electric, gas, and hydroxychloroquine. Well, I go through this thing with hydroxychloroquine, and I go through the thing, and then I come up at the end. Now, here's, here's this thing about life, okay? Mm -hmm. When you're talking about doing comedy and then making people hopefully thinking yeah. about things they had never thought about before, so you're hitting them this thing about, you know, abortion and about 15 years, 13, it's actually 13, not 15 years old, 13 years old, I say. Okay. But then I hit them and I say, well, listen, I think this thing about abortion is sexist. I'm going to start a new movement against vasectomies. And I believe all doctors that practice vasectomies should be fully licensed, connect to a major hospital. Facilities should be all, and, uh, Three days before the abortion, uh, three days before the vasectomy, uh, the individual should be uh, tested for the coronavirus. <laughs> After two days, they should be given a psychological test. So we go through about this, and, mm -hmm. and then what happens is their sperm goes into a vial that is frozen for posterity. Okay. Now, what I'm hoping people will do mm -hmm. is when they leave, is what is the difference? between having a vasectomy and having an abortion. Okay. Okay. Now you begin to look at this. Now, if, if somebody were going to uh, say, um, uh, we can't have a vasectomy, th there would be an upper, it, it's yeah. un unbelievable, but we can say to a woman, she can't have an abortion. That's yeah. that makes no sense to me. Right. Okay. So then, so in the comedy that I do, I just put these seeds out here. Yeah. And then as a person's driving home, they're thinking, well, what is all this stuff about life? What is all this? And uh, you're so it comes to back when you're talking about losing your mind, I'm talking about what death is. Death has got to have something to do with, I mean, life has to have something to do with the mind. Yeah. So maybe when you lose your mind, that's when life stops. Mm -hmm. Okay, instead of the heart. Now I'm just throwing this out. I mean, no. you, you consciousness. And I, you know, I mean, we, you know, you're talking about stuff. Yeah. I'm just sort of talking no, around. No, no. Well, but I, these I, are things that I think about. I want to jump off what you said real quick because uh, so my dad died of cancer like about five, two years ago, and I found a courage in my dad, him facing his death, that I did not find in the time I knew him uh -huh. from before. And he was always, always like, he's like, okay willing to do chemo, but he was only willing to do the treatment up until the point that he had a quality of life. You know, after that, he's like, I don't want to live if I don't have my quality. I don't have a life. Like this guy, like literally picked his own casket, made all the arrangements for when he passed. That's courageous. And, it, you know, to the point that you're saying, like, I am also not afraid of death. I am going to die. I could die in a car crash tomorrow. I could be 10 years from now, you know. Maybe I live 100 years from now with all the things. It really doesn't matter of when. I try to live life so that I, at the moment that I close my eyes, that I live a good life up to that point. And 
then like if he's willing to live only as long as he has quality of life, as you mentioned, as long as you have your mind, if I'm thinking they live a good life at that point, then yeah, what is life? And what is a life worth living? You know, um, that actually, you should come back for a cause of the thinking where we explore what is life. Yeah. <laughs> that is a great one. Uh, the, the, you could speak the, to the it, thing, certainly. Uh, this, this, uh, You've provoked a lot of thought. Of course, I'll be driving home here tonight, <laughs> thinking about a lot of things that you've talked about, and you've talked about just just different things that we've sort of rolled over in our mind. And most certainly, when I came here, I thought we were going to be talking about stand up, and we got off on some uh, some pretty heavy heavy stuff. But the thing of that that to me is this: there's another thing that 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 I think about. I've outlived my parents. Mm -hmm. My parents outlive my grandparents. My kids are going to outlive me. In other words, when I say outlive me, that means in terms of, of years. In other words, my parents mm -hmm. died in the 60s. I'm 85, mm -hmm. okay? My kids are going to most certainly live to be 100, 110. Their children are probably going to live to be 140. Yeah, like okay? they'll be like And see, with the stuff you know? with medical and everything, what happens... If we physically start living like turtles, in other words, we mm. live 200 years or 500 years as human beings, what is that going to do? I think you are have you a lot worried of about it? You sound so sad. Like, why are you so like melancholy about it? You said turtles. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm, What's I'm, another I'm, equation I'm you can make I don't to that? Think, I don't like to think that I'm a sad person, but I do think about um, life is long and it's short, right? I think I think that's right, and uh, but I do think that the evolution of human beings, evolution of everything, probably, okay. Uh, it's inevitable, okay? Yeah. And people are going to live longer, each generation. Mm -hmm. And as we learn more about the body and about the mind, okay, I'm alive today uh, because of, of medical help. In other words, had I sure. been born 50 years ago, I would have, you know, I, there's no way I could have made it. So they've kept me alive, and thank God I've been able to think. And uh, so those are things that are coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. And um, you got, uh, one time you got, you got talking, you had mentioned to me about money and about the effect that money has. What, what my observation is now is we, when you talk about youth and you talk about like college kids today coming through, the difference, they, they want jobs, but they want jobs that they don't mind working for. Mm -hmm. As they just don't want a job to make money, okay? They want a job that's self, that's fulfilling. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that's different than what my parents went through and different pretty much what I went through. In other words, I went through to work because I had a family. Yeah. And I want to put the family... I'm not too sure that's a good reason to work. I'm no. not too sure that's honorable. Now it might have been honorable at the time. It'll be honorable to your family, I'm sure. You know? yeah. Uh, yeah. But but th those are those are questions that sometimes I just enjoy thinking about, and then I enjoy talking to people about. It. See yeah. what what tickles me is here we are coming in here. The three of us, we're just talking. Yeah. Yeah. What a what a great freedom and venue that we have that we're not afraid to say anything yeah. absolutely is that right. something excellent pro yeah. platform yeah for sure i mean it's just, it's crazy tremendous yeah. uh, i i find it fascinating uh when um yeah as you're mentioning is uh we're talking but we're living life you know i've been and maybe i'm crazy but i'm considering what really we are and what really is life and what really is time. Um, the people that you've, lo that you've lost, like that passed away, doesn't mean that you don't have, still have feelings for them or love them, right? And, you know, life is about shared experiences, right? People grow connections through that. And I, I, I try to think about what if we're just stuck in this 
we're a three-dimensional being living it through time. But if we pull away and we look at our life, and let's say time doesn't exist, right? Then we are just experiencing that like a film, that trajectory through the film. But it's all happening at all time from the birth to the end. And I almost find a, a beauty in that and the fact that, you know, when you pass away, like people that have passed away, to me, they're alive, not in the sense of ghosts. They're alive in my memory because I was there at the point in time. Uh -huh. And I can experience even these memory triggers. I can live there. And if I can live there, that if you take time apart, then they're not really gone. Because you could like you rewind and move forward the film. And then... You know, what does that mean, you know, uh, 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 about life and experience, about what are we? Another, uh, you know, and, and, and we'll wrap up here quickly. Another thought that I always have is what makes you different, you and me, is there's something maybe we're all the same and it's just like a radio, right? It is our hardware, our meat body that allows us to tune into certain frequencies that kind of, well, you know, I'm using frequencies, you know, in an abstract session, that is the reason why we are how we are, right? Like, you know, if I had been born in your body, maybe I'd be you. And if you had been born in my body, maybe you'd be me. You know, and I, you know, it goes to self, but uh, we need to do a cause of the thing and maybe what's life, what's self, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, what is, what is self? Yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. So, but Jim, I don't want to keep you too long. We've gone like two hours. This I has know, been I know, great. this is craziness. Uh, we'll, and we'll, it seems like, yeah. just like this. Yeah, like a blink. Like just like this, like, like a blink of an eye. Thank you for being here. A blink of an eye. Yeah. Where can we hours. find you since Boom. we're going to tell the internet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like yeah. that. Just like, like that. that. And we covered a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. But Breadth it, 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 and depth. And even if it goes like that, you can we can think about it and remember things we talk about and expand it in a much larger mm -hmm. thought than two hours mm -hmm. as we think about some of the things that we covered. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. interesting. Jim, are you doing any shows where can people find you? Uh, I've got, uh, let's see, I should have brought something with me. I'm going to do um, the, the Place Below Zogs, Josh. Rosenstein's asked me to do a showcase um, on the 27th, I think it is, mm -hmm. and it's below Zogs. It's in uh, Chapel Hill. And then, uh, let's see, um, Victoria Niemeyer, she asked me to do a thing on the 25th uh, at Zenith. Oh, nice. I'm doing a showcase at Zenith. Yeah. So I'm doing a showcase at Zenith for her, and then I'm doing this thing with Josh, and um, I've got stuff that's for this month. I don't, I can't remember what next month. Okay. Now I'm not like you. I've I've got to I got to have a planner. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I I can't remember all these things, but I do know those two stand out yeah. in my mind. Those are going to be my my next two showcases. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I think this should be out before that because we, we turn them around pretty quickly um and um you know if anybody's still watching this at hour two uh what do you want to say to them you know about life about what you reading whatever you want i i, I would i would like to just t t tell people that um this isn't a show this this is it yeah mm-hmm <laughs> This is not a study. It's not a research plan. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. This is it. This is real. This is real. And uh, that was the this, aim. You got it. That, that's that's what I'm gonna tell them. Good. Yeah. Thank awesome. You. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you as always, Andy. This has been Manly Girly. We'll see you next week. <laughs> okay. Where did you come up with Manly Girly? Who, who came up with that?